good to see you guys this morning. So yes, mom's doing better, and um, it took her an extra day to get out, but, uh, but she is home, and she even said, so she said, if you take your small group to Cracker Barrel tonight, maybe I'll go. So, so she's, I think that was her saying, let's go to Cracker Barrel. So we're going to try. So anyway, so I have a small group tonight. But, um, so today we're going to talk about tested and true and responding to temptation. And here's what I want you to know. They did that study in the 70s, and it was really funny. If you read old articles about it, they were like, these kids have no chance. I mean, it was awful, right? And let me tell you what they've discovered since then. You ready for this? People can change. I know, it's a shocker. And you have choices about what you do or don't do. And so you can grow in your ability to resist temptation. Did you know it? And it's not just because you get old and you don't have the energy to fall into temptation anymore, by the way. Uh, although, although that can happen. But not to Betty. But to other people. So anyway... Um, I'll never forget a 90-something-year-old lady telling me that peer pressure was still very real. And I said, there's no hope for me. I was like 40 at the time. So today we're going to talk about responding to temptation. Yesterday, I drove a lot. I had a funeral over here, and I was over to see my mom, and I was going back and forth. So I was on I-4, the joy of Florida, and I was on 408, which usually is not too bad. But yesterday morning, for whatever reason, was kind of crowded. And so um, I went I-4, 408, I'm headed to the funeral over in Merritt Island, and as I'm headed to the funeral, uh, uh, I come up over a hill, and I had just gotten past some cars. I'd love to tell you that the cars had just gotten past me, but that's very unnormal for me. And so I had just gotten past some of the cars, thankfully, because as I came over the hill, I don't know, 20, 30 yards in front of me were two metal, look like little refrigerators in the middle of of the lane I was in, and thankfully my ADD kicked in. I looked over, looked next to me, and I swerved around them. And I looked in my rearview mirror, and other people slammed on their brakes and swerved around them as far as I could see. I'm sure somebody didn't see it. Somebody on their phone. What was that? Uh, anyway, but, but the truth is, listen, that is an illustration for all of us of life. Because it seems like everything's going smooth, you're just moving along, things are normal, and all of a sudden, it's like the Google Maps, rerouting, 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 right? And so here's the key, when you go through a time of life, if it's a temptation, if it's a struggle that you're having with something, you have a choice to give into that and get distracted from the goal that God has from you, for the plans God has from you. Jesus, as we're going to see today as we look in Luke, Jesus was tempted with the same things. The Bible actually says he was tempted in the same way as we are, without giving in. And so he understands temptation. He, he recognizes temptation, and yet he never gave up his goal. And, and let me give you two goals of Jesus that are the same as you, because sometimes we think, well, Jesus, I would never, you know, that my goal is not the cross. So here it is. Loving God and loving people. That's why Jesus gave two commands. Love the little Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he said, and the second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, my mentor, Dave Daniel, used to tell me, and you realize, Eric, there's a kind of a hidden command in there that you have to love you before you can love other people. And I used to tell him, yeah, all right, whatever. I give him a hard time about that. So when temptation comes, it's easy to get rerouted, to get focused on the temptation. So we're going to look about three, we're going to look at three main temptations today. And for each one, I'm going to try to give you a practical something that you can do in order to stand up against that temptation. And so I hope that today's message is practical and encouraging to you. And um, here we go. Number one, the temptation of wrong desires. Now, remember, Dr. Luke is telling us this story, and he's gathered it from eyewitnesses. He's the only gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that is, is not one of the disciples, but he knew the disciples. He was a contemporary of Paul's. They were friends. He gathered information from all these people. Why? He wanted to give a detailed account of what Jesus did. So he wrote Luke, and then he wrote 
Acts. And when he wrote Acts is debatable, and you can fight over that and have a good time. I don't really care. So, um, but he, he did all of this. Why? Because he wanted to show that Jesus was the Messiah. And so you'll notice here, there's a couple of clear times that he says that Jesus is the Messiah. By the way, later in the book, there's actually demons that, that say, you're the son of God, which is interesting that even demons are claiming that Jesus is the Messiah. But here we go. Uh, In Luke chapter four, probably a familiar passage to some of you. And we're going to start in three and four and then skip ahead. The devil said to him, now Jesus has been fasting in the desert. He's been away from everybody for 40 days. So it says, the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. By the way, once again, just like I said to the kids, it wasn't a big sin. It wasn't, didn't seem like something, but what was it? It was giving in to comfort. It was giving in to what was easy. And too often, we don't recognize that spiritual warfare isn't this big, huge sin that we think about as, as sin. It's a lot of times just refusing to do what God wants us to do because we want to be comfortable. We want what we want. We want to fulfill our needs. We want to fulfill our desires and not do what he's called us to do. And then Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And so there's two temptations here and they have to do with immediate needs. And we're not going to talk about the other one, but then the next one is this in verse nine, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So what did Satan do? Satan also used God's word, but what did he do? He twisted it. He, said, he made it into something selfish, something self-centered. By the way, that's what people do all the time. They'll, they'll say, God's word says this. And I go, well, well how did you decide that? Because that's what I want. <laughs> and if they're honest about it, they're just saying, I, I, I made God's word say what I want so I can get a new Learjet as a TV preacher because I made God's word say that he's going to prosper me. And that means I get a Learjet, which I'm like, what? Where's my Lear? No, I didn't say that. All right. So here we go. <laughs> Much rather have a really good lazy boy chair. <laughs> just saying. All right. Jesus answered, it is said. So Jesus goes back to scripture and says, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll I'll give you that. But here's what it really says. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. By the way, Jesus there also is saying (laughs) that he's the Lord. He's not going to test what God wants him to do. He knows that what it is. He says, don't put your Lord the God to test. And then listen to this. this. You probably never noticed this. When the devil had finished all this tempting... Remember, Jesus is hungry, Jesus is tired, Jesus is lonely, all the things we're going to talk about in a second. But, but as he did that, it says he finished tempting him. What did he do? He left him until the opportune time. And let me tell you a secret, a non-secret about temptation. The enemy knows when you are ready to be tempted. He knows when a bad day is, when you want to get fall into temptation. Let me, let me tell you how AA words it, and I love this. I think it works spiritually too, okay? They say, be careful of halt. Be careful when you're hungry. By the way, many family fights happen before dinner time because your blood sugar's low, so you fight. So be careful when you're... Some of you are hungry this morning. We have donuts. Go get one. All right. Hungry. Be careful when you're angry, right? Anybody ever said something dumb when they were angry? Rarely say something dumb when you're happy. Like when you're happy, you don't look at somebody and go, did I tell you you're a jerk? (laughs) Right? Well, hopefully you don't. If you do that, you need counseling. All right. Hungry, angry. That's why anger is such a big thing in life. Anger will ruin your life. Anger Anger will ruin a good person's life. And you combine, talking about AA, you combine alcohol with anger. <laughs> okay, hungry, angry, L. What's L, do you think? Lonely, when you're lonely. Why? Because when you're lonely, you make bad choices. You think bad things. You, 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 you're all by, 
All by myself. One is the loneliest number as we ever found. Right? All the lonely songs, you're listening to all of them. Sad songs say so much. Oh, I'm so sorry. You feel sorry for yourself, you throw a pity party, right? And you make bad choices. Hungry, angry, lonely. Last one is what I was last night. Tired. Be careful when you're tired. Because when you're tired, and by the way, we are all... We all have these things, and the enemy knows this is a time to tempt you, to get you to do or say or act on something that's dumb. And those are times when you have to be extra careful. Why? Because the enemy knows opportune time. And guess what? When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, those are opportune times. So pay attention to that spiritual warfare that happens during this time. But listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians. No temptation has overtaken you, but such that is common to man. Like you think you're the only one struggling with temptation? No, common. But God is faithful. You know what's good about God being faithful? When you're not you can say, God, thank you for being faithful. God is faithful, who not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. So I want you to think back to Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve, one tree, don't touch that tree. And where do you find Adam and Eve? Wow, that's a good looking tree. Did you see that fruit? That's pleasing to the eye. I have no idea how a fruit... By the way, fruit must have been very different back then because I look at fruit and I'm like, gotta eat that? Now, bacon. <laughs> I'm thinking when you get to heaven, apples taste like bacon. I don't know. Just saying. That's my goal. So, but, but here they are. Where are they? Right by the tree. They had the whole garden. They're right there. Why? That's what we do. If you go on a diet and you're not allowed to have pizza, you know what you think about? Pizza. You're on a low-carb diet, popcorn. Suddenly, popcorn that you've never wanted. <gasps> popcorn. Whatever the desire is, if you focus on that, he said he'll provide a way of escape. What does that mean? You've got to get away from it. You've got to walk away from it. You don't put it in your head. You don't put it on your lap. You don't put it on your computer. You don't put it, right? You don't, you don't follow through with some of you need to get off social media. I mean, you keep giving into temptation on social media, guess what? You keep typing what you're thinking. And by the way, you thought everybody was smart until you got on social media, and then you went, oh, wow. By the way, your friends are thinking the same thing about you, just so you know, so <laughs> don't get prideful. When I was a teenager, I'll never forget when I became a Christian, I really, one of the things I wanted to, I, I grew up in Miami, so we went to the beach all the time, all kind of beaches, and... Uh, and so as a kid, you know, you're 16, 17, 18 years old. And I had a bunch of friends. And, and one of the things we said was, you know, we're dealing with lust. So what do we do? We, we memorized Job 31.1, which says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully upon a girl. And so sometimes the, they, they would, we would be at the beach and one of my buddies would say, Job 31. And we'd all... Whatever your struggle is in, find a verse. Listen to this. Choose scriptural obedience to escape. That's your first challenge, your first encouragement, your first thing to, if you really want to overcome. So if you're dealing with anger, look up some verses on anger and begin to memorize them. Make them part of your life. <laughs> Hasty words, you know, all those things, right? And whatever your struggle is, if it's lust, look up some verse on lust. If it's anxiety, look up. There's tons of verse. There's like 300 and almost 65 verses on worry and trusting God. And so, so all of those things, look up and make it part of your life. Listen to what Martin Luther said. Uh, Rick Warren uh, adds to it. Martin Luther said, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. You can't keep the devil from suggesting thoughts, but you can choose not to dwell on them or act on them. So when you find yourself in a negative place, when you find, look for the way out. For some of you, when you're getting discouraged and depressed and you're feeling lonely, it may be a simple, you ready? This is, this is so spiritual what I'm about to tell you. It might be time to go to Publix. Even Walmart. If your self-esteem's low, Walmart. 
You're like, wow. I thought I was bottom of the totem pole, but... Right? Sometimes just getting out of your house, sometimes getting out in nature, sometimes taking a praise walk, sometimes just being thankful, just, just getting your mind and your heart out of this place of loneliness and discouragement is not just a physical thing, it's not just a mental thing, it's not just an emotional thing, it may be a spiritual attack that you're under. And so you say, God, I'm going to flee from this, I'm going to pursue righteousness and do what's right. Number dose. The temptation to only speak love. And you're like, what in the world does that have? Shouldn't we always be loving? Oh, yes and no. So listen to me carefully. Have you ever met someone who apologizes all the time? Like, like too much. Like, you're like, dude, you don't need to be sorry that you showed up. And you don't need to, you know, and they just all the time, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then, have you ever met somebody who life is all about them? Like, <laughs> that was a funny response, by the way. Um, it was, that, was, that was audible, and I was shocked by it, just so you know. I was like, have you ever met somebody all about them? Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Hopefully they're not sitting next to you. Don't poke anybody. All right. So, so here's the thing. In a lot of cases, not every case, the person who says sorry all the time grew up in a home with terrible boundaries. They were punished when they didn't expect it. They didn't know what was good, what was bad. They did not have good boundaries. By the way, psychologists say it's not how strict you are, it's whether you're consistent. And anybody who grew up in an inconsistent home goes around in life, and the reason they apologize is they want to keep themselves safe, and they want to make sure that, and by the way, they tend to think you're mad at them and you're not. You you know who I'm talking, you know the people, right? And then the other person, that was the person whose parents gave them everything all the time. And now they think life is all about them all the time. And so what's the balance? I'm going to show you uh, what it says and let's look at what Jesus did here. So Luke 4.22, Jesus goes to his hometown. He's speaking in the temple. This is when Jesus says, hey, this, this, uh, this what Isaiah said. That's me. I'm here as Messiah. And it says this. All spoke well of him and were amazed. Listen, listen what it says. At his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? So they're looking at Jesus and they're like, wow, everything he said was so full of grace. We just love that. Isn't this Joseph's son? And then a few verses later, look what happens very quickly. Jesus talks. He says, Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah wasn't sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. So what is Jesus saying? You realize There were plenty of people that needed help in his hometown, but they weren't walking in faith. So God sent them to non-Jews. So they're like, what? Did, Did he just say that we're not the best of the best? Oh, it gets worse. Then Jesus says, and there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed. And so then Jesus makes it worse by talking about people they didn't like. He says, only Naaman the Syrian. Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. By the way, you'll notice that ties in with the temptation of Satan. Satan thought, well, you're not going to jump yourself. We're going to throw you off. But what happens next? He walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Eric, how did that happen? Did he disappear? Oh. Was it a miracle? Oh. Did he just look at him? I don't know. I know that when they came to get Jesus for the cross and he said, I'm him, they all fell over. They were all like, whoa. So if Jesus wanted to, he didn't even have to go to the cross. He He knew the time, and when the time was right. But notice what happened. When Jesus spoke gracious words, they loved him. 
And when he spoke the truth, they hated him. So what did Jesus do? He spoke the truth in love. And that's what, listen, you want to know if you're maturing as a believer, you're able to combine both truth and love. You understand that God is both merciful, full of love, and he also has justice. And there's consequences for behavior. You understand both. That makes you a balanced person. You're not just a grace person, but you're not just a truth person. By the way, people tend to marry each other where one is a grace person and the other one's a truth person. You, you can point at each other now. All right. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 4 about mature Christians. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him that is the head, that is Christ. Basically, if you're maturing as a believer, you're going to, yes, speak the truth, but you're going to do it in love. You ever speak the truth in anger? Not good. You ever speak the truth in impatience? When you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired? It's truth, but it's not nice, right? So how do you speak the truth in love? You say the truth, and so by the way, sometimes the truth is hard, sometimes the truth is difficult, sometimes it's saying that is sin, but you're doing it in love. It's not because you hate the person or don't like the person or you're trying to teach them a lesson or you're trying to put them down. Why are you doing it? Because you really do care about them. It's the day when you show up at a friend's house and you say, hey man, I just want you to know, I, I think you might be an alcoholic and I'm worried about you. That's the truth, in love. Number three, the temptation to choose people over, the, over God. And this goes back to the marshmallow test. We, we a lot of times give in to what's urgent. We a lot of times in, give in to what's right, not right there. And so here's what happens. Jesus is in Capernaum. This is where Peter's house is. This is where Peter, Andrew, James, and John have their fishing business, right? And I haven't thought of a creative name for that fishing business yet, but Four dudes fishing? I don't know. All right. So at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. By the way, we know that Jesus over and over went to a solitary place to pray. What was he doing? He was getting direction from God. Why? Because when you listen to all the other voices, it's easy to make bad choices. But when you get away, get by yourself and say, God, would you speak to my heart? Would you convict me of sin? Would you convict me of righteousness? Holy Spirit, that's what you do. It says, Jesus went to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to get to keep him from leaving them. They're like, no, no, stay. You're awesome. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also. Why? Because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogue of Judea to them. It's easy to give in to what's easy because it's what we want to do. Uh, listen, it'd be easy for me to play drums every week. I could just get up and play drums, don't have to prepare, just show up, listen to the songs a few times, come and play. Why? Because I played for 40 years. Oh my goodness, 50 years. Wow. When did I get old, Dave? So, so but this is true, right? It's easy. This... I've never gotten a letter as a drummer that said, your drumming stank today. Can I tell you I've gotten them as pastor? I've had people come up to me after church. I didn't like something you said. I go, well, yeah, me either. <laughs> Listen to what 1 Corinthians 3 says about what you're supposed to do. The one who plants and the one who's water, who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. So basically, you don't work for the other person. You don't work for that boss you have. You work for Jesus. And here's the truth. If you're not careful, you will go through life and you'll start in ministry. This happens all the time in ministry. I know this because I've done it a thousand times. And at some point... Somebody doesn't show up, people don't do what they're supposed to do, and you think, I'm the only one that helps around here. I'm the only one that does this. And I know Suzanne likes to say that we volunteer people. We don't. You know what your pastor does if people don't show up? We just don't have it. We just don't have a ministry. Well, I want to have this ministry. Okay, good. You want to start next week? Oh, you mean me do the ministry? Yeah, that's what God's put on your heart. Why? Because I'm not called to do what you're supposed to do. And you're not called to do what somebody else does. 
So don't worry so much of how they're running. Say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do, even when it's uncomfortable. I tell people in new members class, even shy people, it's good to do greeting for a few months as a new member of the church. Why? Because you get to know people. But I don't like greeting. I didn't say that. Anybody think Jesus loved watching, washing stinky disciples' feet? Especially Judas? I would have skipped him, by the way. I would have been like, mm, Peter. All right. You're not always going to be comfortable when you do God's will, but you have to say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do. Your final challenge is be faithful to God's calling for you. You don't have to answer to anybody else for how God's gifted you, what he's taught you to do, the abilities that you have. You don't have to answer to me. Isn't that good news? You don't have to answer to that person that you think you're better than because they don't do what you do. You have to answer to God. Because the truth is, you may have 10 times the ability that other person has. You might have 10 times the talents. And so what has God called you to do? What you do. So do what he's called you to do. Don't think you're better than somebody else. You're not running against them. You're running for Jesus. So Jesus, what do you want me to do? And just continue to be faithful. When temptation comes, I want you to reroute. When temptation comes, I want you to think of a verse. God, put this verse in my heart. I want you to learn how to speak the truth in love. And finally, I want you to be faithful to what God's called you to. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you've never surrendered your life to Him, maybe you know about Him, you've come to church for years, but you've never said, Jesus, I'm surrendering all that I am to you. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service. Knowing that you can surrender your life to Him, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, that Jesus died for you and Gave his life so that you could lay your sins down and take up his righteousness. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, one of these things spoke to you and you know the truth. So just do what God's called you to do. And here's the deal. Next week, we're going to have a ministry fair. And it may be that today you thought, you know, I think I'm better than so-and-so, but I'm not doing what God's called me to do. Well, next week, we're going to talk more about that and being obedient and saying, God, I'm going to do what you've, uncomfortable or not, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. I'm going to step out in faith. By the way, every time you step out in faith, he blesses you. Every time. So expect it. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word, your strength, your power, your love. I pray today, Father, for the ones here who you are speaking to, that you would continue to speak to their hearts. Help them, to those seeds that have been planted, to go deep. And Lord, continue to do in them what only you can do. Father, thank you for a church that loves you, where people serve and love and do what you've called them to do. Lord, I pray that we would never grow comfortable, but we would continue to do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.